slightly foggy in this thing right now. It's kind of hard to see. Hi there, welcome back to the shop once again. It's Mike. On my table here today is a huge pile of stuff. And uh, all of this stuff is all of the components that you would need to build a as near as possible screen accurate vac suit that would have been worn by one of the belter characters in season one season two of amazon's the expanse um, i've made it clear in previous videos that i absolutely love the expanse and uh, one of the things i wanted to do was to gather all the parts that production had used to make these vac suits in the early seasons and to replicate that as closely as possible now some things are not uh, found parts by any means. They're custom made. They are bespoke, if you will. Uh, one of them is, of course, the vac suit. That's what this thing is right here, the suit itself. Those are custom made, and there are a lot of parts added to the different things that are custom as well. But I am going to build this entire suit and show you how to do it yourself if you want to, and what parts you need, and what you need to do with them to make them look right, uh, so that you too can have a accurate, or near as possible accurate, back suit from the expanse for one of the belters and uh, yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna start with actually the most complex part of this build which is the brain bucket and uh, i'm going to show you what you need to do to that thing and the precautions you need to take when you build this because um a, a bit of caution whenever you work with old military equipment particularly military equipment from this period you run the risk of it being uh, filled with lead paint and lead check is your friend because you do not want to sand lead paint but before we get ahead of ourselves let's uh, clear the table and uh, get to work so in the early seasons of the expanse and even into the current seasons the helmets that were worn by the belter characters are based on these and this is a chinese built tk1 high altitude flight helmet uh, it is a license built copy of the soviet ghs4 now you can find these things on eBay for about $250 and all the way up to $1,000, which is ridiculous. You shouldn't really pay that much for these things, maybe at the most $300. Now, when I spoke to Jim Murray about why these helmets were used, in the early seasons of The Expanse, their budget wasn't super high. And in a lot of productions, spacesuits are often custom made, and he didn't have that option. So he found one of these, presented it to the art department, and they accepted it. Now the other, not like the main crew of the Rocinante, the four main characters, in the early seasons, the vac suits that they're wearing are largely similar to the one that I'm going to be making. The primary difference is their helmet. And the helmets that they used are actually made by a company called 3M, and they are uh, M1, M100 VersaFlow helmets. Now these helmets here were used by, uh, in this case, the Chinese Air Force in uh, what would be the MiG-19s and MiG-21s and by the Soviet Air Force in the same type of aircraft. And these have been largely surplused recently. And there's some evidence that they were used by the North Korean Air Force as well. But what we're gonna focus on is actually the modification of this helmet into a belter helmet. And I'm gonna use the character Doga Harari as sort of a basis as how this helmet's gonna be set up, but it's just gonna be a very generic one. Now, the windscreen on this thing uh, in mine, in particular, actually has a defrosting system, which you don't see that in a whole lot of the belt or vac suits, but I'm going to go ahead and use it. And then you have these latches on the side to open it, which are going to stay. And this whole helmet actually breaks down quite easily. You open these up, and then you remove the top shell, which just cam uh, clamshells off there, and it's held on by a little hook. You have a little leather liner inside, which uh, that's just going to stay. And then the face plate itself, it has a latch on the front here, which pops open, and then you remove the actual face plate, and then you have your liner head ring assembly. And then it kind of comes off there just like this shell does. And then you have all of this goodies on the front. That's your defroster controller there. And then you have your, <clears throat> excuse me. Now this defroster, actually you can see the defrosting lines in here. And this is, makes this a later mark of this helmet. The early marks didn't actually have that. Now this part, which has your hood and ring, in if you buy one of these things, what you're going to end up with is you may have the remnants of what seems like a membrane inside, and it's this disgusting rubber membrane. You're going to end up getting rid of that entirely just because 
that creates an airtight seal for the pilot for high altitude work. And you don't need it because it's, it's completely unnecessary. And oftentimes these things are fairly disgusting when you get them. I've, I've taken apart three of these and every time that seal is just rotted entirely. And it's just one thing, one more thing to dispose of when you, uh, when you start to work on these helmets. Disassembly of this part, which is going to be necessary to remove the hood for re-dyeing. It's quite simple. It's just a, a matter of, of a Phillips head screw on either side and you run those out and then you'll be able to split this two part assembly and remove the inner liner and then the hood itself. Now make certain that you keep all of the hardware that comes off of this thing. There is actually no available replacement hardware for these at this time. So don't lose anything. Now your hardware is out. You can actually just split this assembly by pulling it apart, remove the top section, and then the bottom section actually just slides away from that inner liner. That's the part that actually makes contact with your face. And now you can remove the hood itself, which is actually just pinched in between that metal frame and this, I'm not sure what this frame is made of, but it's lined in felt. And you may have to actually tear that, uh, rubber seal to get it apart entirely. And now down here, there's a communication line that goes through there. You'll actually have to remove that seal from around it. I just tore it off because it's just so rotted. It doesn't really matter. I'm going to set that aside until we dye it. And then this is your, your inner liner. This part actually makes contact with your face. You will want to clean this quite a bit. As a matter of fact, don't put one of these things on your head until you've cleaned it entirely. To remove the seal, it just has this green band around the outside. Now I've seen these bands both blue and red before, but in this case it's just green. So you just take it right off the outside. It's just held on by tension. Now your shell. Now I've got this thing marked out for some parts already, but on some versions of this, it will have a modification that's been done for the purposes of adding a uh, polarized screen uh, for operations at high altitude where there's no clouds, it's just very, very sunny. And then you have this block and tackle on the side, which is actually part of an ejection system. It would be attached to the ejection seat and would actually pull the pilot's head back in the event of an ejection so that their head doesn't strike the canopy frame. And for the most part, a lot of it can just be unscrewed. Some of it you will have to drill out, especially if you have corroded fasteners. Like this underneath, this plate will need to be completely drilled out because it's held in with rivets. Okay, so you're now done with the shell and the face plate, those bits right there. Now it's time for this, this guy right here. Now this not a huge amount of modification gets done to this and you're gonna have to be real careful stripping that paint off there because you don't want to damage this seal because that seal holds the windscreen in and all the rest of this stuff and you don't want to damage but that green boot right there that gots to go and then uh we'll we'll get to the rest of it as we get to it but uh for right now let's get this green boot off of here which is going to be really simple and we're going to get rid of it with uh, a humble scalpel. Always use a sharp blade in your scalpels. Don't use dull blades. That's a great way to get cut rather easily. I know that sounds like an oxymoron that you'll get cut worse by a dull blade than a sharp one, but a dull blade is harder to control. I'm sorry, military collectors, for what I'm about to do. I am one of those, so I even feel terrible about doing this. Now that's exposed and it needs to be. So with the mask, you need to remove this surround here. Now it's just actually held in with these, in these little poppets right here, these little devices on the side. Don't throw this away. At some point in the future, these things may become uh, rarer and need to be restored and having parts like this around that are in good shape uh, will be good for collectors to be able to restore these things to original condition as far as the rest of the contents this spins out counterclockwise take that little ring off and then you can remove this device 
And this, you actually need to remove this right here. Cut that off. that's off You'll be able to pull the oxygen hose and then here this device spins out and then that can be removed now these are just simple flathead screws Now, whilst that strips all of its paint off, we need to add some parts to this because now we can begin, now we can begin actually converting this helmet now that it's got all of its paint stripped. So these all came from uh, Thingiverse, these bits and bobs here. And uh, I, the, that's the user's name, uh, the, the Thingiverse user that actually created all these files right there on the screen. Now, this was made for a slightly different mark of this helmet. This has, these ridges on the back here, which is probably a manufacturing thing. Um, and that doesn't quite fit. You can see there's a quite the gap right there. So I need to remove this. And then these vents will go up here somewhere. And then of course the lights, which go along the side. That's pretty much the extent of the modification I need to do. There's some stuff I need to, to attach to it. But that's really the only thing I need for drilling because I have to make these lights work and this has to has to meld quite perfectly and seamlessly with the helmet itself. So let's get to that business. Okay, so we have everything stripped. I went ahead and I primed this and put a coat of paint on this guy uh, just because I wanted to see how yellow worked. And I think that's the color I'm going to go with. The face mask itself, of course, stripped down. I've just gone ahead and I've painted it a semi-gloss black and you can see I had some paint transfer there but that's okay. I left the inside unpainted because it doesn't really need to be painted but make sure you do a good job masking this. I had to scrape a little bit of paint off because I didn't get everything sealed correctly. But the parts that I downloaded from Thingiverse I put this on the back already and I've sanded and puttied everything. Now comes 
the lights. You need to install these lights. Now, to install these lights, you're going to actually have to cut a hole in this. And I've attached these with rivets, but I'll show you how I, I went ahead and did it. Now, this is one of the 3D printed lights. And I have 3D printed this actually a long time ago when I first planned this. So they're not the best 3D prints. But what you need is you need a piece of either clear acetate or Lexan or acrylic, something clear. I've used, I've used plastic bags in the past if, if need be. But you're gonna basically, you're gonna create a, a drill template. You're gonna line up the holes in the center of the hole, this big guy here. And then you're gonna use this to transfer the holes over to the helmet. Now, positioning these things is not easy because a series of complex curves and finding the correct positioning is a lot of eyeballing and measuring. And I measured from about, I think, eight different points on each side to get them lined up correctly. I, I was going to build a template for it, but it just, I couldn't make it work right. So this is, this is as best as I can do. And it should be pretty close. Now, if you try to use the rivets on the side, because there's a rivet just like this on the other side, they do not match up. If you look inside, you can see that this rivet over here and this rivet over here are actually not in the same position. They're just tilted off just a little bit. So don't use those as a guide because they will not be 100% accurate all the time. You have two other rivets that are exposed on this, one in the front and one in the rear. They are also not lined up. So try, don't use those to get the center of your helmet. If, you, if you're going to create a center line to base everything off of, do not use these rivets as a matching point because they will not line up every time. Good consumer advice, that. Okay, so we line this guy up. And, and, and mark our first hole. Don't use, don't drill all the way through while holding this here. Just use it to mark your hole. You can use a marker if you want, or a pencil, or something along those lines. And I'm using a number 30 drill bit. And when you drill through the back, you're going to see, you might hit, you might hit the leather lining a little bit, but that's okay. In the long run, that's not going to matter. Now, if like me, you've worked in aviation for the better part of eh, 20 years, and you work sheet metal for a long time, or if you've worked in the sheet metal trade, you're going to end up with a lot of different tools. And among those tools, you may have collected up some Clecos and Cleco pliers, or also known as spring clamps. These things are using, used for holding two pieces of metal or two pieces of material together through drill holes. And the way they work is you extend them out with these very specific pliers that really only have one use and put them through the hole and then as you release these these jaws widen out clamping both parts together and I'm going to use that for this because what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my my drill template template stick it in there and now it's held in place so I can drill these other two holes or mark these other two holes without this shifting around you can also do this with a bolt or another drill bit that you can just run through there to keep it lined up. Tape is also a good option. So there's my, my holes marked. I'm just off that rivet, which, I mean, technically I shouldn't be that close, but I am, and that's just the way it is. All right, so there's all three holes marked. Now I have to increase the size of this one to match this. And what I'm going to use for that is called a rotor brooch. It's, it is a sheet metal cutting tool, and you can see I already did it to the other side there. That's that's the, the remnant bit that I cut out. And mine are from Blue Point because I at one time hated money and liked to spend it on stuff, particularly tools. But there's a lot of different rotor brooch sets you can use to make these holes. Now you can also buy metal hole saws. Um, I don't know that you can find them that small. Uh, but you can also just use a, like, draw your circle, how big you need it to be, and run drill bits around the outside of it and take a file and clean it up. Or if you have a giant, uh, a set of giant drill bits, you can just run a hole straight through. The issue with this, though, is that right on the other side is this liner. And I don't want to damage the liner. But because of the stopper that's on it, it'll, it'll prevent it from cutting into this liner.
magicalness. Now to do the attachment through these holes, I'm just going to use aluminum pop rivets and my Marzen pop rivet gun. You can buy these at Harbor Freight or Home Depot, Menards, wherever. Not this specific brand, but there are pop rivet guns available and they're quite simple to use. So in this case, I'm going to run a rivet through the hole and then into Now you don't have to line it up perfectly with the first one. Rivet. It's not a perfect rivet, but it'll do. Occasionally when you pop one of these rivets, you'll get the stem stuck in there. It won't eject like it's supposed to. Just work the gun back and forth until it falls out. Lights. How cool is that? Now, for the other exterior details, we've got a couple of vents that need to go on there. Why you'd have a vent on a space helmet, I'm not sure. I mean, they really, they look like intake scoops, but they're just details and they're fun. Now, since I'm basing this a lot on the helmet worn by the character Doga Harari, this image here, he has these two vents up front and they're about there-ish, I guess. Maybe off to the side a little. The bonus is, is that every single one of these Belter helmets that these were based on, um, they're almost all completely different in some way. So I kind of have carte blanche to do what I want. And I can make it, I can use, I can pull details from a bunch of different helmets and still make this thing pretty accurate, which is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to end up pulling some details from other helmets just, just for the sake of doing it. And also because I like certain details. I like the way that Dogo Harari's helmet is set up. So I'm going to try and match that. I'm going to actually use the lights to line these up and see where I want to put them. What do you think? What do you think of that? It looks right, doesn't it? Looks correct. Pretty decent. I'm going to call that a win. pencil. Now this is just basic lining it up. This is not their final position. I'll measure everything here and make sure that it's all lined up and then I'll draw my boxes and that's where stuff will go. If you can find one, find yourself a flexible scale, a flexible straight edge. For complex curves like this, particularly helmets, and I've done a lot of helmet restoration in the past, so I have a lot of use of these. The most Efficient one that I found, or one that is one of the best that I found, is actually from Necromunda, a, a Games Workshop board game. And I use this thing a lot to get around these curves. All right, time to prep them for installation. No, oh, now he looks sad. Now one minor detail that exists on every single one of these helmets is that there's two rivets, two pop rivets, at least appear to be pop rivets anyway, on either side of the center rivet that comes standard on the helmet. I don't know if that's for holding a piece of equipment in for filming, perhaps it has something to do with the internal lights, I don't know. But to make this thing as accurate as possible, I need to put a couple rivets in there. So I drew a marking line and points for the rivets, drilled the holes, and now I'm going to install those rivets. And that's just, that's just another detail that, uh, that the folks at the Expanse added to it. Okay, so, so we had the faceplate that was painted just black, and the oxygen hose, uh, you remember how that goes back in, it just, that device goes in, and then it's got the little ring there that screws in place. I used electrical tape around this side to give it a nice uh, bit of tightness to it. You can do it however you want, but there's not really anything done to the oxygen hose beyond that. 
On the mask, there's a little device right here that actually covers up all of these holes right here. I don't know what that was made from. I made that from just sheet styrene and just painted it black with these little uh, squares here, red. There is what appears to be a grill that goes over this latch. I haven't identified it yet, so I'm not gonna put it on just yet. And then around the outside of this, if you are a member of the Expanse cosplay group in the files section, there's some 3D printed files for these that go around the outside of the mask. And I used actually a heat gun to bend them, to heat them up and bend them, because they, they print flat, of course, to meet all of the contours. And now every mask is slightly different and some have this and some have, there's a couple other accessories that you can actually get on these helmets. Um, so I had to sort of make it fit. And then those were painted black and dry brushed with some gray. And then the only thing left on this mask, actually, is this little thing. Now this has this little ring on the back. Now when you take this thing apart, you thread this off and then there's this sitting over top of it. It has a paper seal on it, or mine did anyway. And then inside you'll find this valve. Now you don't need that at all. Uh, that is actually just for when the pilot breathes, it's to get all of the CO2 out. If you remove all of that, it remains completely open. And again, the Expanse cosplay group, you get the file for this cover that goes over top of it, which if you look at Miller's helmet and a couple of other different characters, you can see it has some sort of cover on it. And that may have been a 3D printed device or not. All I know is, is that on the file section of the Expanse cosplay group, you can download this file for free and then you can put it on yours. Now I went ahead and my, I painted mine to look like an AN fitting, that blue color, which I did with just some Tamiya weathering powder. And then reinstallation is actually quite simple. You put it through there, flip the mask over, and then take this ring, and oh dear, and then thread it back into place. And then just hand tight is enough. And that will allow air to escape and to come in, which will give you a little bit of extra ventilation. As far as proper ventilation of this thing goes, because if anybody's ever worn a mask like this knows, it will fog up instantly. The ventilation aspect of this costume and particularly this helmet and the lighting will all come, take place in the next video when I build the pack, because the pack is gonna have a couple of different electric motors in it. It's gonna have a couple of fans and then all the power for the lights which will power the lights that go around here, the lights on the helmet, and then all of the lights on the pack itself. So in the next video, we'll get to that. But this is the mask done. And in all truth, the rest of the helmet is done as well. Now, I skipped ahead because priming and painting, that is gonna be entirely upon your decision. I wanted to make mine a, a safety yellow, a worn safety yellow color, and then just fade it really hard. And you can fade these things pretty easily and weather them pretty easily just through the use of sandpaper because it's metal underneath. So the metal shows, that's actually natural metal showing under there, not paint. The plastic parts is a different story. You'll have to dry brush those. And getting into weathering techniques would take uh, an entire video unto itself. All of the decals are actually um, handmade. I, I actually just downloaded images off the internet, threw them into Inkscape and then printed them onto decal paper. And it's, the way that this was explained to me by Jim Murray, uh, the prop, props master for The Expanse, was that the decals on their helmets is sort of like a union tradesman. They, they tend to have different union organizations or trades or places they've worked on their helmets as sort of a, uh, so almost like a job history. And I even added a real union on here, the metal worker or sheet metal workers union, um, which actually my grandfather belonged to. And I wanted to do sort of the same thing. So this sort of tells the story of where he's worked. Centauri, Calypso, Tycho, Eros is over here. The number is actually the ship number that he is a part of, which that's a tale for another video as well, because I've, I've gone ahead and I've created an entire backstory for this guy. And of course he was involved in um, the Medina station modification, which is what that's from. And he worked for Savage Industries as a contractor, or he's done some work for Baratnas Gas. Um, there's just a Epstein inside. And of course he's a proud member of the OPA. And uh, I added Misco and Marisco on there uh, just simply because I thought it would be fun 
And maybe, maybe this character has a daughter and, and she stuck it on his helmet before he went to work one day. Who knows? Mal Kwiatkowski logo, which is a bit defunct. And then this one, which is not Expanse related at all. Modine's 2. If you're a fan of Canadian television or absurdist humor in general, you've probably heard of the show Letterkenny. And a lot of the actors from The Expanse have actually been on Letterkenny or got their start on Letterkenny. And I'm a huge fan of Letterkenny, so I wanted to do a little call out to Letterkenny. So the Modines 2, which is the bar from the show or one of the bars from the show. But that's the helmet done. So let's put the mask on here. And there's one other item left with this. And that is the liner. Now, if you'll recall, with the liner, we took that out when we disassembled the helmet. The reason for that is because we needed to paint everything. We also needed to dye it, because if you recall, this was an olive green. I dyed this with some synthetic black dye, uh, dye meant for synthetic fabric. You will need to dye this. You can actually see where some of the string pulled through and it didn't get dyed completely, but it'll do for what it is. One of the reasons that I left this out is because as I was toying around with this thing when it was disassembled, I realized that with with the liner out, it's actually attached to this faceplate. And if I want to take the helmet off, I have to remove this as well, which is going to be tucked down inside my suit. So a bit of uh, maybe a suggestion, a piece of advice, if you want to call it that. If you do one of these helmets, leave this thing out and I'll show you why. Now, a piece of advice about the hood. With the hood on this thing, this guy, Normally, it's attached to that faceplate, and it's one with the helmet. But you have to remember, when these things were actually in operational service, this was a part of the sealing system that actually sealed the pilot off from the environment at high altitude. You don't really need that with cosplay. So, a bit of a suggestion, because having this hood attached to the faceplate would require you to pull the whole hood out of whatever vac suit you're wearing, instead, leave it out. Because, and my voice is going to get obscured here in a minute, you put this thing on, just like you would a balaclava or the hood from a hoodie, what have you. And then this part around here, the cowl, is actually down inside the vac suit. So if this was still attached to the helmet, I'd have to pull this whole thing out and reset it in the vac suit every time. So I'd have to open up my vac suit, etc. If you leave it out, you take your helmet, which no longer has this thing attached, and just clamshell it open onto your head, snap it shut, Bob's your uncle. Now, it does wobble a little bit more, but in the event that you want to sit down for lunch, you want to have uh, a conversation, use the restroom, what have you, and you don't want to wear a helmet like this, you can just Pop this thing off, clam shell it open, set it on the table, you're done. Pull this down and your head is exposed so you can cool off, you can get some wind, water, what have you. But just as a suggestion, don't reattach this thing to the helmet because it's really not necessary. As I said, its original purpose was to protect the pilot at altitude. You don't need it anymore. And that's pretty much it. That's pretty much all that's involved in the modification of a Chinese uh, TK-1 high altitude flight helmet or you've managed to lay your hands on one, a Soviet-built GHS-4, into a belter vac suit helmet, or at least one that is as close to screen accurate as possible. Now, some of the details are unknown because we just haven't seen them up close. I haven't personally seen them up close uh, to be able to know exactly what it is that's going on inside. And all of the lighting that's intended to light the actor's face and the ventilation will all be done when I modify the pack. Now, that won't be the next video. Uh, the next video will actually be the modification of the Guardian Fall Protection Harness. The reason I'm going in that order is because the pack ends up attached to this harness. So I need to modify the harness first, and then we'll be able to do the pack, and then the boots, and then all the accessories that go along with it. Final weathering, done skis. But that's it for the vac suit helmet. Please like and subscribe. Leave a comment below. Tell me what you thought of the video. Please consider Patreon to help support my channel and check out my other social media links below. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please also leave those below. Thank you again for watching. Cheers.